and welcome. He immersed himself in politics from an early age and went on to become a popular leader of his country, known for his honest and frank approach to problems. He also took on the challenge of championing human rights. This week on 101, meet the former Norwegian Prime Minister and founder of the Oslo Center for Peace and Human Rights, Kjell Magna Bondovic. Hailing from a city overlooking the Norwegian Sea, his strong political and religious family influences early on in life shaped his progress into adulthood. Kjell Magnabondovic's studies centered on theological themes, he's ordained as a Lutheran priest, but his political path began early, pushing him into the limelight as a charismatic young man who mixed easily with world leaders and took responsibility quickly. In 1998, he also made headlines as the first head of state to officially take sick leave for mental illness. His openness won him a lot of public and professional respect, and he's still considered one of the most accomplished modern-day premiers of his country. In 2006, the avid footballer founded the Oslo Center for Peace and Human Rights, giving him the ideal platform to continue his efforts in the area of interfaith understanding and international dialogue. Well, uh, Kjell Magnabondovic, it's great to have some time with you. Thank you so much. I, I have to ask, considering you're so passionate about interfaith dialogue and the need for people to understand each other. When you look at the state of the world today, do you think that the divisions genuinely are greater? Or have some of the things that have happened over the past few years since September the 11th helped people to actually learn more about each other? We have uh, learned more uh, about each other, no doubt. But on the other hand, I think the tensions also are uh, higher and stronger than before. Um, primarily, the conflicts are not about religion. But some of the conflicts have a religious dimension because we know that in some regions, political leaders are misusing religion to steer up a conflict. So I think it's so important to avoid a conflict between the Muslim and the Western world to bring people together across these borders. Uh, at the Oslo Center for Peace and Human Rights, we have been engaged in such projects, uh, especially one with former president of Iran, Mohammed Khatami, who is a dialogue-oriented man, reformist. And we had uh, have different conferences and workshops about Islam and the West, and try to uh, analyze what do we have in common. What's getting in the way of that dialogue? Is it politics, whether it be geopolitical uh, issues? Is it religious leaders? What's the main culprit for stopping that dialogue? In our dialogues, we have invited both academics, uh, political leaders, and religious leaders. I think we need all of them. There are many interreligious dialogues going on around the world, but we need to bring more politicians into them, the decision makers. They have to really acknowledge uh, the force of religion, sometimes, unfortunately, to, to the bad but it can be uh, turned around and be used for reconciliation. And um, uh, I think that is a huge challenge in the world of, of today. Have you come across a lot of people, when you go across and try to promote this dialogue, have you come across a lot of people who really are just so closed off to the idea that you know, you know you're not going to get anywhere? Or is there always a space to get in? It's always a space, in my view. Uh, and I, I, I think many people are surprised at what, uh, how much we have in common. Uh, and that we should, uh, we should use that uh, to the benefit uh, of all uh, people and to calm down the tensions. That is, uh, that is possible. A special project we had uh, regarding um, interreligious dialogue is about the holy sites. We know that holy places often are misused to steer up conflict. And in some conflicts, they are destroyed. We have seen in the countries on the Balkan, we know in, uh, in Jerusalem that the holy sites is really the core of the conflict. Uh, we can say it in the simple way that there will be no solution on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict without a solution on Jerusalem. And there will be no solution on Jeru yeah, Jerusalem without a solution on the holy sites. And so therefore, uh, we need to, to develop a code for holy sites, which we are working on at the Oslo Center, uh, to, to manage how to, to solve this problem, because there are so strong religious feelings connected to the holy sites. And it's so sad to see that these, these places sometimes are misused. 
Well, let's look back to how you got to this point and what has shaped your, your views. You were born in uh, Molde in, uh, on the Romsdal Peninsula yeah. in, in Norway. What was life like then in those days? Simple life. <laughs> I grew up in, uh, in a family, very active in the Christian uh, church. Uh, and I got my Christian education. So I'm even an uh, ordained Lutheran pastor myself. Yeah, That's yeah. rather unusual that the prime minister uh, <laughs> was an ordained pastor. <laughs> but when I had, uh, have the dialogues, for instance, with Muslim leaders, this, this is an advantage. Uh, for instance, when I met um, President Hatami, uh, who is also a uh, Muslim theologian, we both understood the religious language and the political language. So we were, in, this, in a way, on the same radar. Uh, and that was very uh, useful. I was engaged uh, in the youth organization of the Christian Democratic Party. My family was very active in, in politics. So when I came to the capital of Norway, Oslo, I started my uh, studies. I was more and more engaged in politics. So I even was elected to the parliament before I graduated as a theologian. But uh, fortunately, I also succeeded in uh, graduating uh, later. How did you adjust from being out in, in the sort of rural lifestyle to the big city as a young man? It was really a change. I, I remember that when I lived in that rural area, a small town, Molde, I sometimes uh, thought that it would be very good to come to Oslo, a bigger city, could be more uh, modern lifestyle. I looked forward to that. And of course, uh, in many ways, it was good to come there. I got friends from all over the country. Uh, through my youth organization, I also traveled to other uh, countries and got impulses from, uh, from other countries. But on the other hand, I also got more and more respect for my own background, my roots. Uh, so I can say that I have a luggage with me from my home, uh, which I found very valuable. Now, your, your parents, uh, as you say, were very active in the Christian community and the family was very strongly rooted in, in the religion as well. How did, you, how did you relate to your mother and father? In what way did their characteristics rub off on you, apart from the religion? My father, who, who lived till he was 102 years old, and he passed away now only three years ago, uh, he was the man in my life whom I respected most. He was a very wise man. He never forced me to do what he wanted, but he said what he, said what I, uh, he thought was right and wrong, but he let it be up to me to make the choice. Uh, and my mother I also respected very much, and she wanted me to be a pastor. <laughs> I know that she prayed for me to be a pastor, <laughs> and, uh, but she passed away rather early. I was only 29 years old, so uh, she didn't see me as an ordained pastor. But she saw me as a theologian student, so I think uh, she thought that I would end up as a pastor. There were people in your family, like your, your cousin is a, a bishop in Norway as well, Odd yeah? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so it's, the roots are quite strong. That's true. And I said that in our family, it was mainly teachers and pastors. <laughs> so that was a very strong uh, tradition also in our part of the country. Uh, where Christianity has a rather strong standing. Uh, but of course, it was also some years of my life where I thought maybe I should leave Christianity. I think it was more an uprise against uh, the environment, more than uh, the religion. But so I gradually came back, and that was also through uh, a Christian youth organization at uh, the high school, where uh, I found that it was really uh, amazing to be there uh, and I got friends there and I met uh, the girl who now has been my wife for 40 years. It's interesting you know because uh, it, it's so much a part of the culture the Christian youth as you were saying and I guess it shows how things have changed in this day and age. If you were talking about Muslim schools people think of the madrasas which is just a Muslim school essentially but it's always associated with extreme thought whereas in this case actually it was you say a unifying force. Yeah. For us, it was that. And it's interesting also that some years back, many people, especially in the West, said that religion will play a less role in future. But what do we, uh, what do we face today? Religion is playing an even more important role. Uh, and uh, some have also said to me, you are a Christian. How can you have a dialogue with a Muslim? That must be very difficult. My experience is the opposite. Because Muslim believers, they understand me. 
uh, who am a, a Christian believer, uh, it's more difficult, I feel, for them to understand an atheist or an agnostic. In, it's interesting because, of course, Norway in, in, has grown so quickly as a country since you were a child uh, into the, in modern years. And how have you seen that, you know, from your childhood, what you remember of the, the way people conducted life to the way things are now? What, what do you think is the biggest change you saw? I think media represent a very, very uh, strong uh, change. Uh, when I grew up as a young boy, we didn't have television. So I remember very well the day we got the TV into our uh, house. Uh, I think I was around 14, 15 years old. It was a big change. So through the TV screen, I saw the national politicians and also international politicians. I think media has uh, really made the change. The other factor is, of course, the globalization. But everything is now passing the national borders. Uh, workers, uh, service, uh, information, goods, and so on. There is no real national borders more in that way. So this has changed uh, our lives. And of course, also the modern um, uh, data uh, technology uh, has changed the mobile phone. How could we uh, li live without? But we did, and it worked. <laughs> and of course, when you first got into politics, a lot of that technology didn't exist. I'm going to ask you about your rise through the political system in Norway in just a moment. We're going to take a short break here on One on One. More with Kjell Magnabondovic coming up in just a moment. Don't go away. Welcome back. You're watching One on One. We're speaking with the former Prime Minister of Norway and founder and president of the Oslo Center for Peace and Human Rights, Kjell Magnabondovic. It was a very early career for you in politics. I mean, really, you were a very young man when it started. And I wonder how you adjusted to the idea suddenly you're making decisions that, that potentially affected the whole country. Of course, this came gradually because I was engaged in, uh, in the youth organization of my Christian Democratic Party uh, already when I went to uh, uh, the high school. Um, and when I came to, as a student uh, to Oslo at the Faculty of Theology, I was very much engaged. As the leader of the youth organization, I, I uh, became a member of the board of the party, the National Party organization, and observer to the parliamentary group. And so the party leader asked me to be uh, what he called the personal secretary for him. Uh, I wrote, wrote speeches and uh, gave him memos and gave him some advices. And so he asked me when he became prime minister and back in 72 to be his uh, state secretary, we call it in Norway, it's a deputy minister, at the prime minister's office. And then suddenly I was a full-time politician <laughs> and I hadn't graduated <laughs> my theology. Uh, and so uh, I was asked to, to be nominated to, uh, to the parliament. I was only 25 years old uh, because uh, one of our members in the parliament from my constituency around Molde, he became ill and he had to, to leave politics. Uh, so it was an opening for me. And I uh, won the nomination <laughs> competition. <laughs> so from uh, that time, I was a full-time politician. And so gradually, I, I got new positions as a deputy leader of the party. And so I was a leader of the party. and. And so I ended up as prime minister. So, of course, I had some years to prepare myself. Gradually, I got more uh, influence. But, of course, to be a prime minister is different from every other political position. I, can, I think I will say that nobody can really imagine what it is to be a prime minister without having been it. Well, let me ask you how much you think politics changed over these years, because you saw that transition from being such a young man uh, through the system. How different was Norwegian, uh, were Norwegian politics in those days? I learned a lot, uh, especially uh, I met people from other political parties in, in the parliament, and um, I got respect for them, and I understood that many of the political issues are not so simple. It's not black and white. Sometimes I felt that they, they are right. <laughs> uh, and I have to make a compromise. Uh, and that I learned a lot uh, of, of working in that way. Uh, and so um, uh, I got respect for other views, for other politicians. I even got friends in other uh, political parties. Gradually, I was more and more international engaged also and got impulses from uh, international uh, leaders. I was more and more became more and more 
engaged in and committed to, to try to assist people who are poor and oppressed. And that's what I'm also doing today uh, through my engagement in the Oslo Center for Peace and Human Rights. You actually gained a lot of respect uh, from your country folk for uh, when you took your leave in 1998 for mental illness, came back, said to everyone, this is what it was. This is the pressure. This is what caused it. And, and I think you were surprised really by the reaction, weren't you? Yes, I was positively uh, surprised. Uh, of course, in a way, it is not uh, an easy decision when you become ill. I got my diagnosis from my psychiatrist. He said, you have a depressive reaction. And what should I do? Because I had to leave office for some days, I thought. Uh, but that was too optimistic. Of course, it became some weeks. Um, we found that we had to go out with a press release. And they asked me, my people uh, around me asked me, what shall we write? So after thinking of that for some minutes, I said, why don't say it as it is? And that, there were two main reasons for that. First, we could avoid speculations about what is wrong with the prime minister. Has he got cancer, or is it a heart attack, or what is it? And the second reason, and that is the most important, was to contribute to fight stigma around mental health problem. Because stigma is the main problem regarding mental health, still. That is also an important message. It is possible to return to the working place after a mental illness as it is to return after a physical illness. And I was even re-elected as prime minister for the second term. Yeah, it's interesting because I think it actually did open up the debate in the country and it did help destigmatize the issue. And it's kind of interesting you contributed so much towards a better understanding as well in that. I do believe so. Through my four weeks leave, I got more than thousands letters from common people in Norway. And in a small country like Norway, that is rather much. <laughs> and many of them said, when you have chosen to be open, I can also now be open. I can share my problems with my family. I can go to a psychiatrist. And that was so meaningful to me that I could be to help to other people. Because one of the main problems is that people don't talk about uh, their mental illness. And then the burden will be very heavy. If you can share the burden with other people, it's much easier to recover. And that's the beginning of, uh, of recovery. Politics, well, it's actually interesting you were saying, because it's very rare for a politician to say, let's tell it as it is. <laughs> so I was going to say, politics, of course, became interesting for Norway as, uh, as, as the country's wealth grew. And suddenly, you were in, in charge of a country that had clout around the world. Was there a, a clear turning point when you could see Norwegian politics could actually be exported? Absolutely. And it's right that Norway, we are rather active uh, in international politics. And maybe we have more influence than uh, the small country should, uh, should mean. I think there are, we have some advantages compared to, to bigger nations. We have no colonial past. And that is an advantage, especially in Africa. We have a rather high level of development assistance. And we are not a superpower. So uh, I think that uh, there are no uh, thinking of that Norway has a double agenda. <laughs> uh, I think they, 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 they trust us. They think that we are coming there to contribute to improve the living conditions. So um, another important advantage, which has been the starting point for uh, several uh, peace processes where Norway has been uh, involved, is that we have many non-governmental organizations, NGOs, working around the world. And they have been there for many years. And if they have been in a conflict-ridden country, very often they get confidence on both sides of a conflict. I thought it was because you had Viking blood and they're all scared of you. <laughs> we also have. But I don't think that Norwegians are more peaceful than others. <laughs> and if you go really long back in history, you are right. <laughs> we cannot be proud of everything we have done internationally. You did actually, uh, as a country, though, highlight the importance of empowering women. And, and I think uh, in your government, too, you had the, the highest number of women uh, uh, members as well. Is that correct? That's right. It's politically impossible in Norway today that, to have less than 40% women in the government. Uh, so, um, so that has been the case now s since the 1980s. So I think Norway is rather advanced in, in that regard. Uh, we have also around 40% women in uh, our parliament. We have used, to some extent, the quota system to increase um, the participation of women in political life. And we have even also done it, and that was a proposal from my own last government, 
we have used quota system to secure um, a minimum of women in the boards of uh, the bigger Norwegian business, uh, even private companies. Funny thing, a little story that I was reading about how you made a comment in the media about how uh, IKEA's uh, instruction manuals oh, keep showing men and they should have women in them. And there was quite a reaction. I was surprised how much of a reaction it gained. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Because uh, sometimes you, you can really see a discrimination of women also uh, in PR and in advertising. Well, of course, then now people say, are you willing to put together IKEA furniture? You have to practice now. Yeah, <laughs> and I, myself, I'm an amateur in that regard. <laughs> <laughs> what is there, you, I mean, of course, the, the, of course, the Oslo uh, Center for Peace and Human Rights is, is doing very valuable work, and you're active in a number of areas. What else would you like to accomplish with that? What I did when I stepped down as Prime Minister, I founded the Oslo Center for Peace and Human Rights, and my vision is, through that center, to um, uh, make a contribution to resolving conflicts, to increase the respect for human rights. And of course, I want to make a good use of uh, the network I developed through my many years in, in domestic and international politics. So mainly, we are working on leaders' level in the political life and in the civil society. But our goal is, of course, to make an impact on the grassroots level to improve the living conditions. Do you have much time for hobbies? Not so much. <laughs> <laughs> I use the free time for my family. I'm lucky to have three children and eight grandchildren already. Uh, and I'm very interested in soccer, in uh, football. Uh, I play myself yeah. uh, twice a week, and I also watch very much football on TV and uh, also football live. What would you like to be remembered for? What would you like your legacy to be? I want to remember for, be remembered for uh, an engagement for, uh, for poor and oppressed people. That maybe I could have contributed some places to, uh, to a difference. And I hope that the Oslo Center can uh, represent an added value. Kjell Magnbondrik, thank you so much for your time. Good luck with all your work. Thank you so much.